Back in 2014, the world of Formula One was undergoing a little bit of a change. Just under a decade beforehand, forgive the abrupt time jump there, the sport had changed over from 3 litre V10 engines to 2.4 litre V8s. This was done in part to save costs, also to limit the ever increasing power output of the cars, and partially to preserve the hearing of any living organism within a 60 mile radius. And these engines were used right up until the aforementioned year of 2014, when they would introduce a new powertrain that is still used to this day. It's a combination of a 1.6 litre turbocharged internal combustion engine, a battery, and an electric motor, revving up to 15,000 RPM and generating over 900 horsepower. These means of powering an F1 car in the year 2024 are so boring. In comparison to those glorious 3 litre V10s that produced a sound only ever matched by super volcanoes or gods, these 1.6 litre turbos are just bleh. But whether we like it or not, we are stuck with them. These are the rules and regulations, despite the urging of emeritus professors all over the globe to have more noise. But let's just say the FIA one day decided, you know what? Y'all can have carte blanche here. Whatever you guys can think of, you're allowed to do. Some may go back to V10s or V8s. Some may stick with what they already have now. Others may adopt electric powertrains, or perhaps they'll get V16 rocket cars to run on synthetic fuels. But what if you wanted to differ from the conventional routes of propulsion? What if you wanted to go against the grain? What if, for argument's sake, you were completely insane? Back in 1966, an American by the name of Ken Wallace was dreaming up concepts for what he had hoped would bring him a win in the fabled Indianapolis 500. Back then, the regulations weren't quite as restrictive as they are nowadays, so whatever LSD hangover-induced creations could be dreamed up were likely to be perfectly legal. One night, Wallace looked to the stars for inspiration. At that moment, a plane flew by, and he thought, hang on a minute. At that moment, he drafted up plans for a gas turbine powered Indy Racer. It was unlike anything ever conceived up to that point, and it kind of showed. He first presented these plans to legendary driver Dan Gurney, who promptly shot them down. He then went to Carol Shelby, who offered him a sum of five bucks for the bus sphere to get out of his sight. Eventually, Wallace did find a backer in Andy Granatelli, and the STP Paxton Turbo Car was born. When this thick boy rolled up in the paddock, it instantly drew attention, and the sight of it being wheeled to the dummy grid made Many of them wonder, hang on, how does this actually work? Okay, so the engine was a Pratt & Whitney free turbine, obviously, and was mounted on the left side of the car, a beam the driver. It would compress incoming air, mix it with the fuel, then once it was ignited, the high pressure gases would spin the turbine. The power was sent through to the transmission, which was then sent through to the car's four-wheel drive system, and thanks to the torque converter, there was no need for a clutch pedal. The power was somewhat restricted, thanks to USAC, the governing body, limiting the engine air intake, but it still did generate 550 horsepower. Plenty good then, but there were some uncanny characteristics about it that sort of need mentioning. First off, it had major throttle lag, three seconds to be exact. Plenty of time then for the driver to look in the mirror to see who exactly was about to hit them. And unlike any other propulsion system put into a car, this thing would idle at 54% of full throttle. So if for some reason the brakes decided to not work, you were gonna be stuck out there in what was effectively a runaway car. Isn't science and engineering just fun? Of course, if you're like me, and you're in a mood to learn how any of this mumbo jumbo works, you're gonna need a good place to start. And in that regard, this video sponsor is brilliant. Like, literally. If you're unfamiliar and you need a crash course on this brand, Brilliant is where you learn by doing, with thousands of interactive lessons in math, data analysis, programming, and AI. Through these lessons, you get a hands-on approach to problem solving that helps you build understanding from the ground up. It's a method that has proven to be six times more effective than glaring at lectures, either in person or online, and hey, it works for me too. And these courses have been curated by people who have worked at places such as MIT, Google, Microsoft, you name it. To gauge a good starting point, I recently tried out their Introduction to Probability course. And I gotta say, it is perfect for learners of any level to start learning data analysis with its fully built out suite of new content, ranging from base theorem to multiple linear regression. Of course, this is merely the tip of the tip of the iceberg. The catalog goes far deeper than that. So, to try everything Brilliant has to offer for free for a full 30 days, visit brilliant.org forward slash Josh Revel, or else scan this big QR code on the screen right now. Or else you can click the link that's in the description box below. You're also going to get 20% off an annual premium subscription. So all in all, only way you can describe this is, is that it's brilliant. Cliched, I know. Right on. So the turbine car, how potent was it? 
Well, when it rocked up for its first race at Indianapolis in 1967, it proved to be very fast early on at the hands of Parnelli Jones, qualifying in sixth place overall. Of course, Jones was an extremely capable driver, but that only served as one part of the equation. He needed to have the car underneath him as well. Then when the race got underway that Sunday, Jones started to work his way up and then he got into the lead and he was staying there. It seemed that Jones and the turbine car were en route to a famous shock win. Eventually, the racing gods decided that that couldn't be right and struck him down with a transmission bearing failure just a few laps from home. It was a devastating outcome. Nonetheless, the people of the paddock right then and there realized that there was something more to this contraption than what initially met the eye. In particular, Maurice Philippe of Lotus tried to convince his boss, Colin Chapman, to create their own version of the car. Once again, the concept had shown its potential, almost winning the 1968 iteration of the event. By this stage, Chapman was fully on board with the concept and planned to eventually draft the car in to Formula One, starting from 1971. And the first place that it was put through its paces was at the Race of Champions event at Brands Hatch. And during practice, in appallingly British conditions, the Lotus 56B was ferociously fast. But once they turned off the rain and brought out the sun, it started to plummet down the order. And bear in mind, they had two-time world champion Emerson Fittipaldi at the helm. Odds are this was as fast as it was going to go if it were only ever going to be dry. And by this time, Chapman was starting to give Maurice the side eye. It seemed that if they were ever going to hope for it to work, they were going to have to pray for rain. And in that year's Dutch Grand Prix, that's exactly what they got. After starting the race from 22nd, Dave Walker, driving the Soul 56B that weekend, began to work his way up. After five laps and lapping faster than anyone else on the circuit, Chapman was elated, as was Walker. But in all of that excitement, Walker slid off the track and fell out of the race. And in every other outing from there on in, the Lotus drowned at the bottom of the pack, never again to see the front of the grid. And come the end of the season, it would never race again either. So historically, as a powertrain, turboprops, turbines, jet engines, whatever you want to call them, have never really worked for Formula One. But with over half a century of innovation between then and now, could the geniuses of modern day F1 conjure up a jet powered Formula One car that could work? Well, the short answer is no. Long answer yes, with a but. The modern day wizards of Formula One land can make cars work on virtually any propulsion system that produce more power than a pencil sharpener. And their advancements are far beyond what they were when they actually used these things back in the 60s and 70s. But as we saw back in those times, the feasibility of actually using them, well, that is in question. It works perfectly fine on an oval like Indianapolis when traveling at a constant speed since turbine or jet engines are more efficient at higher RPMs. But it did have great difficulty and putting its power down coming out of the corners, at least compared to the other cars of the time, only ever coming into its own in the wet conditions when more measured pedal inputs were required. And that's because these types of engines just aren't very good at rapid speed changes. And considering just how much faster these cars have gotten since the 1970s, the issues faced back then would likely be amplified nowadays. There's a reason no one has reattempted this feat, even just as a fun project, since the 56B. Will we ever see a jet turbine powered car back in Formula 1 in the future at some point? Well, I kind of already answered that, didn't I? I wouldn't hold my breath, though it is a part of history. And in its own way, the 56B did end up being an important step toward the future of the sport. The shape of it was very unique at the time. It was sculpted that way since the turbine allowed for it. And while the car itself never won anything in Formula 1, the shape of it was used as a basis for the championship winning Lotus 72, and thus got the ball rolling for the rest of the cars that followed. Probably not what was intended when the idea was first conjured up when Wallace gazed at the stars that night in 67, but Alas, here we are.